This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's back in black this year. This is the new Surface Pro 6 for 2018, with the same physical design on the outside, other than the new black color, still available in the platinum light silver color if you want. Anyway, same physical design as last year's model, which was called Surface Pro 2017 instead of Surface Pro 5 for some reason. Anyway, Microsoft's back to using the generational numbers for this, despite the fact that largely it's unchanged from the fifth generation and not so far different from the fourth generation, there are big changes inside to this, particularly the jump to Intel eighth generation four core quad core CPUs. Finally, it's still 15 watt Ultrabook CPUs like you would find in a full size well, 13 inch laptop, for example. So that's still a lot of impressive power inside. And now that we do have Intel 8th Gen CPUs inside, I can recommend this. I couldn't recommend it for our back to school laptops for 2017 because it was short on cores. But now that we have it all, definitely can recommend it. We're going to look at it now. So a lot of the core specs have stayed the same with this. We'll put them up on screen. I'm not going to rehash everything that is the same, like the cameras, the Marvel Avastar Wi-Fi. Why are they still using that? I don't know. It's not the greatest Wi-Fi chip out there. You know, it's dual band, 802.11ac. There's that. Uh, throughput is kind of middling, though. It's not up there with Intel's latest generation of Wi-Fi. Is it a deal breaker? No, it's just a little disappointing on a product this expensive. What is new this year is there is no budget Core M option. You start with Core i5 and you have a Core i7 option as well. Microsoft is still selling the previous generation for, at a budget price for those who are interested in the Core M model of it and you don't want to spend the money. It starts at $899 now, and the good news is it starts with 8 gigs of RAM. And before it was 4 gigs of RAM, which was kind of a shame. So the base model is a Core i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gig SSD for $899. That's not too bad in surface land. And then as you move up the food chain, it's $1199 to move up to a 256 gig SSD, keeping the Core i5 and the 8 gigs of RAM. You can go all the way up to 16 gigs of RAM, and that's the max still, because they're still using low power DDR3 RAM, I assume, for the power savings and battery life is improved, so I won't complain too much about that. And you can go up to one terabyte SSD and a Core i7. No matter what, you're going to have Intel UHD 620 integrated graphics. Uh, we don't expect dedicated graphics in a tablet this superbly thin and light. That's fine. But the Intel Iris option is gone. That's not Microsoft's doing. It's because Intel has not made a 15 watt U series CPU in this generation with Intel Iris as an option. You have to move up to the 28 watt CPU. Like, well, that's what Apple uses in their 13 inch MacBook Pro. But uh, the thermal constraints here probably you're just too much to put a 28 watt CPU inside. It's not really what it's about. They have the Surface Book too if you want something even more powerful and a bit more high end in terms of graphics performance and all that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the pen is still sold separately. That's Microsoft Surface Pro Pen. It's the same as last year's model. It's the $99 model that has no clip on the side. The no clip on the side model supports pen tilt. Though the story there is still that it depends on the application as to whether they support it. It worked in Corel Painter. It worked in ArtRage. It works in Microsoft's own apps from the built-in Sketchpad app to OneNote, but it's still not working for me anyway in Photoshop CC 2019. Uh, if anybody knows a way to get it working, please tell me because it would be nice to have that. The good news about the pen though, we'll get into detail later, it is improved. They're still using fast NVMe SSDs. Not the world's fastest I've seen. Some high-end Lenovo models have even faster SSDs inside, but it's pretty darn quick. It gets the job done. It's still a sealed design. You're not going to be opening this up to upgrade it. So if that doesn't float your boat, then obviously this is not the product for you. These two-in-one tablets, which really is just a tablet with an attachable keyboard, generally speaking, not many of them can be opened. There's a couple made for business by HP and Dell. They've made some in the past that are user serviceable or IT department serviceable, but this is not one of those. So for those of you who are not familiar with Surface Dock, here it is. I'm pretty sure I did a dedicated video review of this years ago when it first came out. It connects to the magnetic connector on the Surface. So you have the two USB 3.0 ports on the front. And on the back side here, it comes with its own charger that plugs in here. You've got Ethernet, two more USB Type-A ports, and two display ports. It can drive one 4K monitor at 60 Hz or two 1440p monitors at 60 Hz or lower resolution monitors obviously as well and you've got audio out now this thing lists for 199 but it's often on sale because it's been around forever like i said i got mine on amazon for 99 dollars on sale so do look out for sale so this is what you get instead of usb-c or thunderbolt 3 in terms of easy 
large scale expansion for this Surface Pro. The display resolution stays on the same on this. You can see that on screen. And it's a 12.3 inch display, again, same as before, but they've swift, switched from a sharp display to an LG display. It's quite color accurate. The, the factory calibration on it is good. It's not a super wide gamut display. It never has been either, but you get full sRGB coverage and 77% of Adobe RGB. It's a very nice display. Contrast on it is also excellent, certainly above the fold compares to most luxury ultrabooks, which is what it's competing with basically luxury two-in-ones. It's an excellent looking display. It is glossy. You can put a matte screen protector on it if the glare gets to you because yeah, despite the fact that it's bonded glass, it's reflective. Brightness is quite high on this, higher than most of the competition, which is nice. When it comes to light bleed, there is no light bleed on the left side and right sides and the top on ours and just the faintest littlest amount on the bottom that you can really you have to be looking for it to see it so they did a good job with light bleed on this device so besides the fact that that pen is going to cost you an extra 99 dollars and probably if you're buying something that's a pure tablet design like this you do want the pen guess what the keyboard is still extra too none of that has changed so the base price of this is always the base price asterisk plus pen cost plus type cover cost. So the base type cover is 129 bucks. If you want the fancier Alcantara ones, you can go up to $160 if you want the embedded fingerprint scanner. It does have a Windows Hello camera. It's a five megapixel front camera and boy, it has gotten faster. Over the years, it has greatly improved having reviewed every generation of Surface Pro out there. And even compared to the Surface Book 2, where it takes a while, it thinks, long enough for me to start nervously grinning at the camera. Do you do that? Do you have a Windows Hello camera and do you just go, like you have to smile at it, you know? This one is so fast. Even just registering your face is like, boom, it's done. I'm like, really? Really? No, having to move my face around or doing anything? And the login is very fast. Is it ultimately as secure as something like Apple's Face ID on the iPhone? Eh, probably not as much. Could it be fooled by a picture of you? Maybe. But it works really fast, and that part is sweet. And I haven't had anybody else fake being me yet. So before we talk about the pen experience, which surprisingly is improved because Microsoft really didn't talk about that very much. Let's talk about what you all want to know about heat and performance, right? Now it's not as bad as the gaming laptops for the eighth generation, which have been running just really hot with the core temperatures. This in an Ultrabook CPU, the 15 watt one is not nearly as much of a problem in general, but still they do run toastier. I don't know how Microsoft really did this, but everybody should do whatever they're doing. The Core i5 is still a fanless model, which is very rare. Usually only the Core M and Y series CPUs have no fan because they're very low power CPUs. So it's pretty rare to have no fan. And even that runs pretty cool and doesn't throttle. It does a good job. In fact, it'll go over 15 watts of utilization under heavy load, which is impressive. No fan. It gets warm on the bottom, on the back. It does not get burning hot. And the upper left-hand corner is generally the warmest position on it. So your hands might get a little warm, a little sweaty, but not like, oh, my hand's burning or something like that. Now we have the Core i7, which is really pretty cool because there haven't been many reviews with that. That one does have a fan. It is a very quiet fan. I ran through half of the PC Mark 10 benchmark, which is a long benchmark, runs about 25 minutes, before the fan even came on. And I had to put my ear really close to the upper left-hand corner to hear it at all. So then I said, okay, we're going to run Civ 6 at native resolution, which is quite high on this, and see how it goes. The fan was barely audible. I held it in my hands without my hands getting burning hot. So compared to, say, Surface Pro 4, for those of you who are upgrading from older generation or Surface Pro 3, it is night and day in terms of thermals. They have done a very good job with the cooling here. And even better when doing something like playing Civ 6, after a half an hour, you can see the temperature monitor on screen, what it read there, and the CPU cores didn't go higher than the mid-80s, which is phenomenal. I mean, I wish gaming laptops could manage that, you know. And even better, if you look at our PC Mark 10 benchmark results here, it gives you performance graphs. It shows you how many watts it's consuming, the CPU, what the temperatures are like. And you can see that the temperatures, generally speaking, didn't go much higher than upper 70s, 80 degrees centigrade. And this thing consumed watts way above its normal nominal load of 15 watts. You can see it going all the way up to like 50 watts of power consumption, which means it's really juicing up the CPU to give you extra performance. It's doing this without making noise, without getting burning hot. That's great. Not just for your comfort, not just for the ear noise, but also because it's good for longevity. It means the thing probably won't burn out. You won't have bulging battery syndrome because the battery gets too hot because the internals are getting too hot. That internal vapor chamber cooling is wildly effective. So. 
big plus. And the performance on this, again, what always made Surface Pro pretty exciting is the fact that you've got an Ultrabook in something this small and light. And it becomes even more exciting and compelling now that we have the four core CPU inside. So when I was playing Civ 6, a game that's not usually a whole lot of fun to run on Ultrabooks, but the quad cores have helped it out some, I played that and I really didn't get bored waiting for turns to happen in the least bit. It was snappy, it was fine, and graphically, that's not a very demanding game, so it's perfect for the integrated graphics there. It is just kind of cool all over again to see Microsoft doing that. Now let's talk about the pen, because I know a lot of you are artists who follow me here, and note takers too, and for note taking, it is perfectly fine, and it's a very nice size, and it's very lightweight. Obviously, it's always been popular for that. What has improved with this Entrig pen, Microsoft bought Entrig, and that's the technology they're using for the active digitizer and the active pen that still uses a quadruple A battery that lasts six months to a year. It still have 4,096 levels of pressure, which is plenty enough. We have tilt support, though, like I said, works in most programs just fine. It, I'm not getting to work in Photoshop yet. Oh, well. But the palm rejection, which was the Achilles heel for Entrig, it would, well, be it an HP or any other competing brand that used Entrig, but particularly Surface products. Those of you who watch my videos know I have a Surface Book 2 15-inch, and ultimately for art, I kept not using it because the palm rejection was so bad. I'd wear an art glove, and somehow even... It, if the art glove was thin, it would still detect my palm, and I would get line vectoring and unwanted marks on the screen, or it would start scrolling. It's, it's really quite good now. It's at least as good as Wacom AES, which is the competing similar technology that's used in a lot of laptops, like Lenovo Yogas, that sort of thing. It's good enough that I was drawing in Photoshop and I wasn't even wearing a glove, which is unusual. I almost never do that. So greatly improved. So for those of you who are taking notes and you were just getting deranged by stray marks on your screen and the, the jiggling of the page, it's pretty good. Still in the OneNote in the Metro app, the Live Tile app, once in a while I'll see the page still move a little bit because of my palm, but it's nothing terrible. It's not flying around or anything. They're just a little bit of movement. And I am left-handed, so I write hook-handed on the screen. So I tend to trigger palm rejection issues more. So vastly improved there. The pressure curves have been good since last year, and the latency has been very good for last year. So they really didn't have much to work on there. It's actually a delight to draw on that, which is nice, because it's great to have full Photoshop available in a size of this small. So lastly, there's battery life. You get the same little compact charger with a USB connector on in case you want to charge your smartphone off the charger as well. And the same 45 watt hour battery inside. But somehow, despite the increase in cores, we're seeing a great improvement in battery life here. I suspect that the LG display is more power efficient than the Sharp display was. And that's the, probably the big difference here. So on the Core i7, that one consumes more power to to be fair, generation over generation, I'm seeing about an hour longer run times with the Core i7 and an hour and a half with the Core i5 compared to the previous Surface Pro 5 or Surface Pro 2017, whatever you want to call it. So battery life was almost the Achilles heel of Surface because it was so small there wasn't much room for a battery. And it used to manage about six hours, depending on what you were doing, like to moderate use sort of thing. And now it can go well, depending on whether you have the Core i5 or Core i7, you can go seven, seven and a half hours without really trying too hard. Again, light to moderate use, including some drawing in Photoshop, a little photo editing, streaming video, MS Office, that sort of stuff. It's really pretty nice. So now we're actually getting competitive with Ultrabooks in terms of battery life. It's not class leading. I don't see how Microsoft can claim 13 and a half hours, but you know, manufacturers, they just do. If you set the brightness to zero, maybe, and did nothing with it. So that's the Microsoft Surface Pro 6. Available now, a little bit cheaper pricing. Thank goodness, it's still a pricey piece, but still one of the best two-in-one Windows 10 tablets. In fact, it's the one that kind of started the whole trend. And yeah, I'm really disappointed, just like you probably. It doesn't have USB-C. It doesn't have Thunderbolt 3. We do have the Surface Dock, which is an aging accessory that can be a little flaky sometimes, but it does the job that a lot of us would expect USB-C to do otherwise. The speed on this is fantastic. The cooling, I don't know how they did it with the cooling, but it's really excellent. The performance is there. The pen is greatly improved. I like it a lot. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.